Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is a place for news and reviews of that most wonderful science fiction subgenre, steampunk. The very type of storytelling that blends history and futuristic gadgets and science fiction. Today we're going to veer off of that path a bit with another subgenre of science fiction, military science fiction. I think this is from some of the uh, polls I've seen, one of the most popular types of science fiction today, possibly because it's the least woke, <laughs> the least politically inclined. And so I've definitely gotten into this lately, and, and partly because I have an ulterior motive, because Mrs. Desperado and I have written a military sci-fi book. We just recently completed it, and I'm uh, looking to get it published soon, and it's called Diana's Fury kind of a female-centric, near-future sci-fi with some interesting uh, cyberpunkish type elements to it. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I've been getting into this more lately. And this is more of a survey than a top ten like some of my past ones. It's, it's not, I don't pretend that these are the best, but these are some of the most interesting and some of the most notable. And uh, there's there's sometimes some of these lists you see, some of this stuff isn't even all that military, so I would definitely think that most of these are are pretty pretty much military and war related. First of all, we have to go to the classic, the granddaddy of them all, War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells, 1898. It's a Victorian sci-fi classic. As with a lot of Wells's stories, the narrator has no official name. He just is basically talking to us. And it's not told from a military perspective, but the narrator does deal with a lot of military people and he observes how the Royal Army is trying to fight off this alien invasion of the Martians with their giant lockers and their laser heat rays and so on. And so everybody's probably pretty familiar with the premise, how the, you know, the Earthlings are pretty much losing until Mother Nature kind of helps us out. And it was really, for its time, it was a pretty brilliant book. And it started a lot of the, um, it started a lot of the tropes of the alien invasion novel. Interestingly enough, one of my favorite steampunk writers, Kevin J. Anderson, has done an expanded type steampunk version called Mr. Wells and the Martians, in which, in which H.G. Uh, Wells himself has a, has a part. And, and also Percival Lowell from uh, the Lowell Observatory right here in Arizona. That's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty cool one. Next one is something we also had to put in there because it's, it has to be on every list. is Starship Troopers by Robert A. Heinlein, 1959. And this was a, made into a movie in 1997, but the book isn't much like the movie, um, movie by Paul Verhoeven. The movie was kind of satirizing the book because at the time, even back in the 50s, people were calling it fascist, which is ludicrous. Um, Heinlein had some interesting ideas that he explored and didn't necessarily... Uh, didn't necessarily um, hold them for all time, but I think these were kind of some good ideas. And one of the ideas of the book was that you shouldn't get the vote unless you earn it in some way. Uh, for example, in this, in this society, that you had to be a veteran. I think maybe the Peace Corps would be another, would be another option that you could have in, in the real world thing. But I think it's a good idea uh, in retrospect, in my older, wiser uh, uh, age, I think that would be a good idea. This, of course, is the story of the humans fighting, fighting alien races, including these horrific kind of bug monsters, <laughs> and originated the concept of, of battle armor, which Heinlein invented. Pretty cool. It, it's a staple of most military sci-fi nowadays, and it kind of allows it kind of allows women to fight alongside men too, because the the strength is in the uh, machine. This won a Hugo Award way back in 1960, although, as I said. It got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, feedback for people calling it fascist, which again is ludicrous. And uh, Johnny Rico, the leading character, is uh, Filipino. And so, the, again, I, I'm going to eventually do a show just about Heinlein and refute the notion, among others, that Heinlein was racist. It's utterly ludicrous. But, to continue, another one that ha that is very very much a staple on military sci-fi, The Forever War by Joe Haldeman. This is considered kind of an anti-war classic among sci-fi, but still it's definitely worth reading. 
Uh, Haldeman served in uh, Vietnam. He was drafted, I believe, and, and uh, had I, a lot of the experiences were very negative there, especially. And uh, this story, humans are constrict, conscripted to fight against this alien race called the Torrens. And the war kind of started by accident, almost, because of misunderstanding. And because of, of time dilation, relativistic time dilation, and the distance between stars, the war lasts for centuries, even if the, even if the, the draftees only are in there for a few years and manage to survive. So this is kind of like what happens to uh, William Mandela, the lead character. And there's a lot of really 60 ideas, like um, uh, co-ed, mixed military, when you're having sex with your comrades and stuff like that. <laughs> it sounds, sounds interesting. Uh, you get to smoke weed on your, on your off time <laughs> and whatnot. And so, a little bit different, but uh, he, it was, I guess he had a couple sequels that he did in the 90s, have not read those. Now we go to more of the dedicated military sci-fi stuff that, that, these others are stuff that almost everybody who's read sci-fi has probably encountered. These are more, uh, these are more like you're really into this particular subgenre. First one is a long series by David Weber, and the first novel in this was On Basilisk Station. I've seen this a lot in stores, but I finally got around to reading it from 1993. And it's very Star Trek-like, which is it's, it's very cool <clears throat> in that way. And uh, the female, it's a female captain. She's very strong-minded and intelligent, and kind of she's got kind of quirk, quirky character characteristics, and she's very competent, but she's she's kind of socially awkward, and she's uh, given a, an impossible assignment because she's made some enemies in the in the uh, space navy, and they're fighting other humans. This kind of socialist Marxist human group is trying to take over this uh, independent, uh, proud independent kingdom that Harrington fights for, and this is a series of 14 books, and it's very inspiring and fun in, in kind of a Star Trekish way. So check that out for sure. And here we go to a writer that's a little bit more back on the progressive left side of the spectrum, John Scalzi, 2005 Old Man's War. This was Hugo nominated. I heard about Scalzi, I, he was big in the sci-fi, but I really hadn't heard about him until this sad puppies controversy. Uh, there was conservative conservative writers saying they were being discriminated against, and, and Scalzi was one of the ones that they were criticizing uh, for being, you know, hack and stuff. So I had to read his books to see if they were any good, and I did think that they were actually pretty good, and they weren't actually that lefty, at least back then. Uh, lately, he's kind of joined the Trump derangement train <laughs> of, uh, of people who feel obliged to um, denounce the president for whatever reason. But um, at the time, I thought this book was almost kind of Heinleinian. And in this world, you don't join the military until your 80th birthday. <laughs> and they send you out for the Col Colonial Defense Force. And the reason that is is because they have this regenerative regeneration drug that they only give you if you get in the military. And it makes you young again. And they do it because you've got all this life experience from uh, being 80 years old. You're not this unwashed kid. And they accept men and women. They have battle armor. And again, like in... Like in Forever War, you have uh, sex between <laughs> between uh, soldiers, um, and it uh, doesn't make it seem quite as bad. <laughs> uh, but um, so it's got a kind of a Forever War vibe. But the the regeneration concept is kind of interesting, and I guess this was first in a series of, of six books. So not n not nearly as at least not at least not uh, woke. <laughs> at least not super woke. At the time, at the time of the the first one. Now, speaking of woke, let's go the opposite. <laughs> this was a man who supposedly coined the term "get woke, go broke." Uh, military sci-fi author John Ringo, and the book I'm talking about is "A Hymn Before Battle," published in 2000, and it's part of the Legacy of Alderana series. And there's at least ten books in this series, and it's a very, very realistic military. Uh, Standpoint because O'Neill, no, O'Neill, O'Neill is one of the primary characters, but because Ringo was in the military and he's a specialist and so on, and so he, he 
knows what he's talking about. And it's it's not like myself, what I, I'm talking about stuff I've read, uh, but uh, he's talking about stuff he knows. And again, they have battle armor. I love this premise because uh, these alien races who are being invaded, they come to Earth for help because they are so pacifistic. Uh, fighting back kind of breaks them psychologically. They need the Earth to serve as mercenaries, especially since we're next in line for being invaded by, by this alien race called the Pasleen, who not only invades and plunders the world, they eat the inhabitants. <laughs> so, and they can eat any kind of inhabitant, and just, and, you know, no matter what the biology. So, this is the U.S. military and the Russians and, and everybody, the Chinese, they're all trying to help these aliens, and they're fighting these these really powerful kind of hive mind type aliens. And so it's very, very well written. I'll definitely be I'll definitely be reading more of, of Ringo. Don't let the bad cover design throw you off here. It has nothing to do with the book. It shows a man and a woman in just casual camo walking around with these big blasters. Uh, nothing nothing to do with the book. It's all like battle armor and, and really high tech stuff. So and him before battle, that comes from Kipling, and he's got Kipling verse in between the chapters, which is another plus, because I'm a big fan of, of Rudyard Kipling. So, fantastic. Uh, I will read more of this, for sure. Here's one that I got from Audible as one of the free, free uh, entries, uh, free monthly selections, and it happened to be military, and, and pretty good. Very new, 2020. Uh, Never Forget by Jason Anspach and My Michelle C. Myers. And this features a female Republic Marine named An Andean Broxen. And this is a human Republic or Federation or whatever fighting fighting uh, wars against aliens. And and uh, the uh, she's very tough and she's a leader and stuff. And But she's not allowed to join the Legion, which is what her father was in, because that's all male. So that's part of the conflict, is that, you know, when will they allow females in? And since they have battle armor, you know, women can compete in that. And uh, also, there's the, the corrupt politicians who don't understand or appreciate the military, which is kind of a common theme in a lot of these books, uh, which, is, which, is, which makes it also very realistic. Now, I know this is getting long, but I'm going to go back to The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Robert Heinlein. Heinlein again, yes, because 1966, because this is considered one of his very best. This was kind of a guerrilla war a book about uh, the moon uh, fighting for independence from the earth. In this universe, the moon is a penal colony. They send all the prisoners up there. They stay up, have to stay up there forever, and they have to mine minerals, send them back to the earth. The earth uh, gives them just enough to live and subsistence, enough to buy their food and water and air. <laughs> And so the, eventually the prisoners have had enough and they fight back. And this is a very pluralistic society, very multi-ethnic. Uh, the leader's name is, I mean, the protagonist's name is Manuel Garcia O'Kelly Davis. And they have plural marriages and stuff. It's got a very 1960s uh, experimental sex vibe. <laughs> and uh, it also coined this, the term Tanstoffel. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, and beloved of libertarians, because it's true. And this won Hugo Award, Locus Award, Prometheus Award, and was nominated for the Nebula. So people consider it his best. Uh, now to be outdone, here's a guy that I have encountered in my libertarian uh, science fiction writers group online, uh, Travis Corcoran. And in 2017 he published, uh, using Kickstarter as his method of funding, uh, Powers of the Earth, which is kind of a reboot homage to Moon is Harsh Mistress, in which uh, the Earth, the Moon colony is fighting against an invasion from the Earth. And they had uh, entrepreneurs and scientists uh, developed a anti-gravity device that allowed them to make this unauthorized Moon colony, and eventually when it's prosperous, then the socialist uh, uh, socialist, greedy overlords of the Earth want to come and plunder that too, and so the Earth things have to fight back. Like in Moon is a Harsh Mistress, they have an intelligent, sentient computer on their side, which kind of helps them with the overwhelming odds. Although this one is kind of uh, flaky, <laughs> to say the least, what makes it a little bit more exciting. And they have uh, 
uplifted dogs. They have dogs that are intelligent as people and they can talk and stuff, which is pretty awesome too, one of my favorite aspects of the book. And uh, the uh, sequel, uh, uh, sequel Cause of Separation, uh, and they're actually one long book. <laughs> it's like, uh, highly recommended, especially if you like freedom. So, uh, honorable mentions. There are a lot of steampunk books that I could have put in this list because they are military or quasi-military, but I've already covered them. I'm going to list two works as honorable mention because I haven't listed them before and I think they deserve a mention. First is Queen Victoria's Bomb by Ronald Clark, 1967. A very interesting alternate history in which he posits the very real possibility that a British scientist could have invented nuclear fission back in the 1800s and kind of kept it secret through a, through a uh, British government program. He's even got footnotes explaining how this could be plausible, how this could really have happened. Uh, and so that, it's, that makes it very unique and uh, worth checking out if you're an alt history fan. And uh, finally, Clockwork Imperium by uh, J.P. Medved another guy from my libertarian uh, online writers group. In 2014 he published these uh, steampunk, a series of steampunk short stories uh, relating to a bunch of uh, uh, three soldiers in the Royal Army uh, basically getting into scrapes, mishaps, and doing daring rescues and two English and a Sikh. So it's multi-ethnic as well. It's a lot of fun. I think, I think Medved would have done more had Steampunk not kind of fallen out of favor. Maybe, now that I think it's coming back, maybe he'll do some more. Let's, let's hope so. So, a little bit more about my novel I've written with Mrs. Desperado, Diana's Fury, Near Future, uh, drone pilots who can meld their minds with, with these cybernetic uh, aerial drones, and kind of like a predator or a reaper. But uh, you can fully feel them. And in this world, only women can do this, and only very few of the women. And the, because of the bandwidth, you have to be near the battlefront. So you do have to deploy out into whatever third world <laughs> trouble spot. That, uh, and then you have to be nearby to wherever you're at, that fighting is actually happening. And we have a lot of fun writing it, and we're, we're you know, looking to get it published soon, and so we will keep you informed on this and let you know what our progress is. So thanks for following on this rather overlong uh, show on military fiction, and uh, please like and subscribe. Please let us know what you think in the comments below. But for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, from the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.